Hello, my name is Nigel Griffiths, I work at IBM Power Systems Advanced Technology Support in Europe. In this shared storage pause movie, we'll be looking at the single repository disk and showing you how bulletproof it is. In my previous movie with shared storage pools, we created one from scratch, three commands in three minutes. Very briefly, we used the cluster create command to start one VO server as a cluster, and in there we had some data LUNs and we had a repository LUN. Then we used the cluster add node to add the other virtual I.O. servers. We had dual VO servers on two machines. Then we used the failure group command and created a mirror of the initial state storage pool, so we're now nice and reliable. But some people might say, hang about, there was a repository just done here. That sounds important, and there's only one of them. Is that a single point of failure? Well, in this movie, we're going to investigate is that uh, single point of failure serious or not. Well, I'm going to generate six different sorts of failure scenarios and tell you what happened uh, for each of them. First of all, we're going to move the repository disk. And why might you want to do that? Well, we can use the replace command to move a LUN from one disk unit to another. This actually lets us move the shared storage pool around the computer room. But that will work with the LUNs, but not with the repository disk. Is there some other command to do that? And the answer is yes. It is the change repos command. Took me a little while to find this. Turns out it's the same command as the HACMP, or now called Power HA guys use, because we're using the same cluster aware RX technology. So here we're going to do the replace option. We're going to tell it the old disk name, that's the minus in front, and a plus for the new disk that we're trying to move to, and we give it to the name of the cluster. And that takes about 25 seconds and moves the repository disk from one disk subsystem to another. It's fairly typical of clusters that they actually move very slowly. They don't want to do lots of rapid change. So they go through a long protocol of, uh, like, is everybody out there? Yes, OK. OK, I want to make a change. And they all say, yes, OK, uh, go ahead. Then it makes a change and it says, oh, I've actually made the change. Are you all happy about that? And they all say, yes, we can see the change. OK, now I'll commit the change. And then they say, OK, now we're all done. And what you want to do is avoid something strange happening while you're trying to make changes to a whole cluster. For example, it could be one of the VO servers is terribly overworked and can't keep up, or maybe there's a flaky network that keeps coming up and down, or some administrator's changing something while you're actually trying to change the repository. So it takes a little while to do things, and it makes sure that it makes a good uh, solid change to the repository disk. Next up, though, I did something rather more dangerous. I said, whoops, uh, I accidentally DD'd into the repository disk a whole set of blanks. And, uh, okay, absolute garbage over the repository. Um, there's no way you can get out of that. Uh, so what do you do? Well, you just use the change repository command. The VO servers will be logging, saying there's something wrong with my repository disk, um, and into their error logs. Um, once you spot that, you run the change repository disk command and um, same syntax as before and it will go and create a new one on, on the new uh, LUN. I tend to actually keep two LUNs available so one I'm actually using uh, and then I have a spare one on a different uh, disk subsystem that I can move to if I have any uh, problems with my repository disk. Now, off the record, I asked the developers, well, how can you rebuild the repository disk when I destroyed it? And they said, well, actually, every VO server has a copy and a file. So once they've agreed amongst themselves that it's gone and it needs rebuilding, then they uh, just copy it back into the repository disk. So it's not too hard to actually rebuild it. Next, I thought I'd get a little tricky. So I'll take a shared storage pool VO server down, replace the repository disk so it's moved to a different LUN, uh, then bring it up and see what happens. Well, how does it fix that? Well, the answer is all you have to do is go for coffee. The VO server will come up, it'll look at the old repository disk, that will have been overwritten as part of moving it, the header is taken off it, it's probably filled full of zero, so it'll say clearly this isn't a repository disk anymore. So then it's uh, standing alone, it doesn't know what to do. Well, it says, I have a copy of the old one, let's have a look through that, and I actually had a whole bunch of friends, the other VO servers in the cluster, I'll just talk to them about where the repository is now, and they all come back with the answer, here's the new LUN for the repository, and then it uh, goes and starts using that, and it says, OK, I can play with all my mates, and then it comes back into the cluster, no problem at all. The important point about going for coffee is, don't start trying to hack things, delete disks or move things around, just give it a chance, it will sort that out, work it out itself, and up it will come. It will take a little bit longer to actually get the 
Shared Storage Pool online, but it will work just fine. Nothing for you to do. My repository disks are on IBM V7000 disk subsystem. It has a feature there that I can take a LUN offline. It still exists. The clients can still see that it can uh, connect to it, but it can't do any read-write operations. So how do I recover from that situation? Well, the virtual I.O. servers will detect the repository disk is not uh, read and writable and, and it will produce a whole load of errors into the VO server error logs uh, but they can carry on running provided you're not trying to do an operation like adding a new VO server or perhaps uh, bringing on extra disks into the pool it's quite happy to carry on running without a repository disk if I just get that disk back online, set the uh, permissions on the V7000, then the VO server says, yeah, OK, now it seems to be there. We can do read and write operations to it. We'll stop logging errors, and we just carry on. Next, number five, I did something fairly drastic. I just deleted the LUN on the V7000. It's gone. The disk space has been returned to the, the pool in the disk subsystem. It's gone. We'll never, ever get that back. So what do we actually do? Well. We go for lunch, and then we use the change repository command. Now, I say go to lunch. This will actually take something like half an hour, maybe 45 minutes to get through, and the VO server will be reporting errors. We can't talk to the LUN. There's no LUN. Can anybody else talk to the LUN? The repo disk is gone. And eventually, it will time out trying to retry these operations. Then it will offline the disk. In AOX terms, it goes from available to defined. Only when it does that and actually gives up trying to access that disk that we can actually do anything about the disk. Until then, if we try and do anything um, as an AIX operator to um, actually do I.O. to the disk itself um, or delete the disk or change its configuration or anything like that, all those commands will actually lock because it's uh, waiting in the device driver to try and get a response back from the LUN. After that 30 to 45 minutes, it says, OK, I'm giving up. This disk is not available and it's never going to come back. I've tried everything. And then it puts it in defined state. Then you can actually uh, delete the disk if, completely if you want. You can then go and do a change repository command, just like we did in uh, number one. Just tell it about the new disk. No need to tell it about the old disk because it knows there isn't one. It will take the last uh, best copy of the repository uh, image off the VO server and write it into the new repository disk and everything works fine what I'm trying to make sure is that people don't try doing clever tricky dicky things while we're in that lock state because it's just not gonna work you need to relax wait for it to uh, work itself out and then actually release the disk the next problem we had I'd like to say that I induced laser errors into the fiber channel cables but no, it's actually a GBIC failure. So we actually got to error messages about that, but we found that the shared storage pool was still working, even the node with the failed uh, laser. And this one only had um, one fiber channel out to the disks. So that meant there could be no I.O. to the shared storage pool, but actually it was still working. Again, we quizzed the developers and they said, well, the VO server, if it can't do the I.O., well, it has some friends. Maybe the friends still have working fiber channel connections out to the disk subsystem so quite often it will be able to use them to do the IO out to the disks and so it was just carrying on lots of errors in the VO server uh, error log um, but it could actually carry on and survive for a while of course it won't be perfect performance it will take a while because it's having to ship the requests via somebody else but it will carry on working Really nice touch. I was quite impressed by the developers. They sneak these things in. They don't tell anybody, but it's really good to know that we have some uh, excellent technology behind here to actually help us out when we get into tricky situations. So let's sum up then. Is the repository a single point of failure? Well, technically, yes, there is only one. But the real question is, does it matter? And the answer is no. The shared storage pool will carry on running without a repository disk and it will be telling you that it hasn't got a repository disk. And we can easily make a new repository disk so we can recover from the situation as well. So the repository is rock solid technology. Now, in actual fact, the alternative, when I was asked how many copies we should have, I said 16, let's have lots. That actually introduces more problems than it solves. 
what happens if you have 16 copies of that disk and they're all different? Well, how do you decide which one is the right one? Um, well, you could have some index number that you keep incrementing. But what happens if it has the same index number? It was the last one that was written, but they're actually different. Or maybe you've got um, sort of sp split brain type problems in here where one half of the cluster goes off and does one thing and another half goes off and does something else and they all get out of sync. Uh, if they both have repository disks, they'll both carry on running. So that's not what you want. So in fact, by having a single point of failure, it makes life really easy given the fact we can run without it and very quickly make another one. But the highlighted thing that I want you to get out of this movie is that you really do need to monitor those error log messages on all your VIO servers to pick up when there's a problem with the anything else in the shared storage pool, the VO servers generally, and particularly if there's a problem with your repository disk. So you can actually take that action and recover very simply from it. You might be wondering why I say you have to look at the error logs on all the virtual IO servers. Well, it turns out there's only one of the virtual IO servers at a time is responsible for writing the repository. Let's make sure there's no corruption with multiple access to it. You can actually find out who that is if you run the cluster status, cluster name, and minus verbose option. You get a list of all the virtual I/O servers. Particularly nice command for this on-level feature in here. This can help you work out when you're doing an upgrade of your all your VO servers which one you've forgotten to upgrade because it will say back level for that one. But under this uh, node roles, we have this one DBN database node. This is the guy that will write the repository. As you start and stop VO servers, um, if it happens to be the DBN, it will pass that role to another surviving virtual I.O. server. So it will probably migrate to the longest running virtual I.O. server, but it can be fairly random if you're keeping up your virtual I.O. servers for a long time. This means you do have to monitor all the logs on all the virtual I.O. servers because you're not sure which one is the DBN at any one time, and that will be the one that will tell you if there's something wrong reading and writing the repository disk. Well, I hope this video has been useful. If you've liked it, why not click on Liked below. If you're serious about running your power machines, then these are my favourite places where I try to communicate and share information. Perhaps uh, you'd like to have a look at some of these too.